While we wait for people to settle in, let's go through our announcements. We have just a few. We're all good. Um, we'll wait for Lynn to get to her piano because we have a couple of birthdays today. We need, to, we need our happy birthday music. Marilyn Mullen and Ruth Smith both have birthdays today, according to the church calendar. <laughs> and this afternoon we have Bob's 100th birthday celebration from, I believe, 1 until 3, so if you can all come back for that, that'll be lovely. And the Friday Cafe is this Friday, 11.30 to 1.30. So let's sing happy birthday. Do we have any other announcements? Susan. Skip came through surgery beautifully. That's great news. And we're sorry he can't be here today. <laughs> Thank you, Rory. <laughs> Let us stand for the call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. God bathes my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. And before we turn to our hymn, if you'll have a seat, we will go ahead and let Lynn play the prelude. Oh, you want me to do that? Sure. Let's stand and sing hymn number 401, Here in This Place.
Good morning. Good to see. Good to see those back three pews filled. That just warms the heart. Got to tell you. Um, our call to confession this morning. As children of God's light, we are called to do what is pleasing to the Lord, to participate in what is good and right and true. We bring our confession to God so that what is hidden in us becomes visible and the shadows of our hearts may be illuminated by grace. In unison, please. Gracious God, we are people who still love darkness rather than light. We keep shameful deeds secret, but flaunt our occasional acts of virtue. We see ourselves as blameless, but pass judgment on others. We do not stern badly enough for those who are vulnerable, but stop back, protecting ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. Bring us into your light that we may see ourselves brightly, know ourselves loved, and live more fruitful lives. Shine upon us with your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The psalmist assures us that God's goodness and mercy will follow us, even pursue us, all the days of our life. As God's forgiven people receive this goodness and mercy and live a new life in the grace of Jesus Christ. We live as children of sight, for God shines on us. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, illumine our hearts and minds as the scriptures are read and proclaimed, so that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may see what is good and right and true. And seeing, help us to do what is pleasing to you, so that your glory becomes visible in our words and deeds. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first reading is Psalm 23. I'm taking a little bit of liberty this morning reading from the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second reading, Ephesians. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, sleeper, awake, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Here ends the reading of the word. Praise be to God. afternoon too. So our lessons today in church, and maybe Miss Colleen will even pick up on it a little bit, are talking about our eyes. 
Do you know that our eyes are pretty special? They come in different colors. They can see far away and they can see up close. And like when you're young, most people's eyes work really good, but when you're older, they might not work so good and we need things like glasses. But even some kids need glasses, huh? I'll bet you have some that you know. So our eyes are really special and we blink them all day long and we don't even know we're doing it and it keeps everything clear. They're just really pretty cool. But do you know there are some people whose eyes don't work? And today we're gonna be talking about a man who was born blind. He never saw anything his whole life. But do you know there are two different ways to see things? We can see things with our eyes, but we can also see things with our heart. One way I might describe that to you is, let's say you came to me sometime and said, you know what, I was playing on the playground and I fell and I skinned my knee and it hurt really, really a lot. I might to say to you, oh, I'm so sorry, I see, that must have been really bad. See, I would say I see, but what I, what I really mean is I understand, right? But that's kind of like seeing with your heart. Well, we have two kinds of people in our story today in church. We've got the man who was blind, and do you know Jesus put mud on his eyes? He spit in the mud and dirt and turned it into mud. He spit in it, and then he puts it on his eyes, and then he told the man to wash it off, and he could see. First time in his whole life he could see. But then there's this whole other group of people. They could see really well with their eyes. Do you know they couldn't see at all with their hearts? They refused to recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. And they didn't like him because their hearts didn't see. Their eyes saw, but their hearts didn't see. So Jesus kind of wants us to see with our eyes if we're able but also with our hearts, and everybody can see with their hearts. You know what another word for that is? Love. Yeah, it's love. Yeah, that's how we see with our hearts. So let's take our hearts to Jesus in prayer, okay? Let us pray. Let us pray. Our Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed be my name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us the debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Thank you. That was beautiful. Well, we have a joy in Skip, and we wish he was with us, but we are so happy that he came through well. Do we have any other joys or concerns? Yes. <laughs> that is a joy indeed. He needs his own special happy birthday. Can we sing for Bob? Let us turn now, rise for our prayer hymn number 451, Open My Eyes That I May See.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, our faithful shepherd, we depend on you for everything we need, for daily food, for guidance and protection, for healing in injury and comfort in sorrow. You respond in abundant provision. Thank you for your tender care for us. Thank you for soothing the wounds of this life. Thank you that in the presence of enemies, especially the last enemy of death, you are with us as shepherd, host, home. Knowing your faithfulness in our lives, we bring before you the lives of others, the cares of this world, entrusting all things to your goodness and mercy. Bring healing to those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit, for those recovering from surgery. We thank you for the successful surgery for Skip. We thank you for birthdays and milestones and your ever-present presence in our lives. We ask that you bring release to those who are held captive by old hurts or new bonds that oppress and entangle. Bring freedom to those in unjustly accused, relief to those burdened with debt, and comfort all who suffer from abuse of any kind. We pray for people living precariously in the midst of war. Protect, we pray, citizens and soldiers alike and teach us to put away our weapons, taking up instead words of peace and reconciliation. By the power at work in Christ, break down the walls of hostility we build so that we may learn to live together graciously. We remember those living in the midst of hardship and poverty. We pray for generosity to overflow until needs are met. Help us to see the ways in which we can assist in your kingdom work. Loving God, help us to see the world as you see it, to see others as you see them, and to see ourselves rightly too. Pursue us all with your goodness and faithful love until goodness and faithful love fills every heart and informs every action. We pray these things in the name of the one who came that we might see, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our gospel text for this morning is one of the longest in our lectionary readings, covering the entire ninth chapter of John. So rather than read the text from beginning to end, I'm going to walk us through the text a little bit at a time and pause for reflection along the way. Let us begin with the gospel of John. As he walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This questions the, the, the question that the disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, comes from Old Testament writings and the belief that the sins of the father could be passed down to the third and fourth generation. And as for the man, did he sin? They actually believed that a, a baby could sin while still in the womb. And they, they gathered this thought from the birth of Jacob and Esau because Jacob was grasping the heel of Esau when the twins were born, kind of in the sense that maybe he was trying to pull Esau back and, and that way Jacob be, could be the firstborn. And of course, as we know, later in life, Jacob does in fact trick Esau out of that firstborn birthright, right? And so... The, even the name Jacob means he grasps the heel, and it is used as a Hebrew idiom for deceptive behavior. So this is kind of a background into that kind of strange question, you know, was it him or was it the parents who sinned? But Jesus says it's neither. 
the disciples kind of approach the situation like an attorney, right? Or an, uh, a policeman. They're just looking at this poor blind man and they're saying, who sinned? Who's at fault? But Jesus approaches like a nurse or an EMT with a tender heart. He isn't worried about blame. He isn't worried about cause and effect. He just wants to offer aid. And as for this passage, there are many commentators who suggest that there's a displacement in the punctuation. Because as we read it a moment ago, we had this sense that he was born this way, so that, right? But if we change that around a little bit, we get an entirely different perspective. And in the Message Bible translation, they pick up on this change in punctuation and listen to how it comes out when we read it this way. Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no cause effect here. Look instead for what God can do. This is the point. Look for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here while the sun still shines. Jesus is saying that the world just needs help. And when we offer help, this is how we share the light of Christ. So in acting on this premise of there is no blame, there is only need, Jesus then proceeds to heal the man of his blindness. And so our text continues. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. It is here that we want to pause and consider the miracle. This is the, the thing that has the biggest impact, I think, out of this text, lengthy as it is. And I hope that you will discover what I discovered this week, that restoration of sight was just the tiniest little piece of the miracle that Jesus performed. He healed more than the eye, the function. Jesus healed the man fully. To kind of grasp the magnitude, to understand what healing, what healing looked like for this man in comparison to what we as people can do, we need to understand what it's like for someone who has their sight restored after being blind either from birth or for a very, very, very long time. There are very few known cases. One text that I read said, there, said that there are only 20 of them occurring over the last 10 centuries of sight restored to someone who is long-term, has long-term blindness. When the cure comes through medical means, the vision for that patient is not what you expect because we understand sight we assume that the patient's gonna open their eyes and go, wow, look at the world, it's amazing. But in truth, that's not the case. Consider these observations from some case studies. Right away, the blind man is able to use his eyes. All the scene before him is represented at the back of the eye like it should be. However, this image which composes of numerous objects, all concentrated in a small space, assuming they must be in a room. It's nothing but a confused mass of figures that the patient cannot distinguish. It's only through time and experience that he will be able to judge what it is that he sees. If you ever saw the movie At First Sight, or if you remember the movie, you might recall how the lead character, upon having his bandages removed, was overwhelmed by sight and movement to the point of near panic. The movie was inspired by the real-life story of Cheryl Jennings, who regained his sight after being blind for nearly 45 years. And he lost his sight as a very young child, so he had no real memory or recollection of what it was like to see. According to Jennings, in those first moments of sight, he had no idea what he was seeing. Everything was all mixed up. It was moving unnaturally. Think about it. If your eyes are always closed, you don't see movement, really. It was all a blur. 
So the pictures in front of his eyes made no sense to him at all. He just sort of sat there and stared dumbfounded. And it was not until his doctor said, well, that he realized that this thing he's staring at is somebody he recognizes and knows. From the moment we first open our eyes as an infant, we spend a lifetime learning to see. We learn to interpret the visual world through continuous experience. At first, Jennings had trouble with depth perception, distance, movement, retention. He would jump at a bird that flies by because he couldn't discern the distance between himself and the, their flight path. He would get scared in a grocery store because of visual overload. And he had trouble remembering whether his dog was a dog and his cat was a cat. To him, they were both black and white animals that moved around him. It wasn't until he could go back to the old way to touch and pet the animal that he knew this was the cat and this was the dog. We can't imagine that kind of confusion. For a blind person, objects oct occupy just one tactile point Movement is a new concept. Shadows are absolutely unknown to them and unforeseen, a very strange phenomenon. So is color. The combination of light and shape and color and movement and shadow are described as having an overwhelming, almost explosive emotional effect on a newly sighted person. This is what happens when man heals. Our story says none of this, right? What happens when Jesus heals is he heals fully. Not only was the man's sight restored, but his ability to interpret sight was also given to him. There was nothing left undone. So now we turn to Act 2 in our story, and we read about the reactions of the people who don't quite know what to make of this situation. Our text continues. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Not knowing what to make of all of this, the neighbors then take the man to the Pharisees. They're just confused. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. Notice a moment ago that the man said of Jesus, I don't know. Now he's gaining insight. Not only did he have sight, but he's gaining insight, and he says he is a prophet. This insight will continue to grow for him as we continue through our story. But of course our Pharisees can't grow at all. They have no heart sight, and so they remain stubborn in their refusal to see. But here they have a dilemma, because they know from their Old Testament readings and teachings that they spend so much time devouring that only the Lord can open the eyes of the blind. We read this in the Psalms and in Exodus and Isaiah. Jesus healing a man born blind is just one more testimony to his deity and the fact that he is the Messiah. But they don't want to accept this. And since the concept has them divided, they start looking for a way out. And so they bring the parents of the man in, hoping to find that this is all a hoax. 
Our reading continues. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews, has al Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Probably, since this man was begging, the parents were poor. They were certainly not in a position to risk being excommunicated because being put out of the synagogue is, in a sense, being excommunicated. We don't really understand that concept here because, you know, if one store closes, we go down the street to another, right? If one church doesn't work, we can attend another. We have options, but in a tiny town with limited commerce and one well, to be thrown out or put out is devastating. The man's parents were in no position to go up against these powerful men, but the man himself had no such reservations, as we will see. For the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, I w once I was blind, and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, have I, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciple? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we did, do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opens the eyes of a blind, a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. The blind man held no fear of the Pharisees. In fact, he has gone from saying Jesus is a prophet to saying that he is from God and owning his own claim to discipleship. His transformation is so radical that he has become bold before the Pharisees. Here is an astonishing thing, he says. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes, knowing full well that it is only God that can bring this on. And having hit the mark a little too closely, the Pharisees just start basically name-calling, and then they throw him out because I have nowhere else to go with it. When I picture this scene, I get the sense of the character of this blind man. His eyes never worked, but his ears did. He was standing outside that temple every day begging, yes, but their words had lofted out to him, and they spoke as they walked past him, no doubt. He understood everything. He understood their teachings. He understood the history. He responds to them intelligently, without fear, countering their accusations with pinpoint accuracy every time. He gets them, and he's not afraid of them. And he has an advantage over them. He's equipped with insight and bravado that they will never possess. For having lived as an outcast, he has no fear of their threat to make him one again. Consider the case of a blind man facing sentencing. What will you do to me, asks the blind man. 
I will commit you to a dungeon, replies the magistrate. Ah, sir, the blind man replied, I have been in one for 25 years. There's a difference in his perspective, and he's not afraid. And he already knows what Jesus can do. You see, that threat of excommunication is of little consequence to one who is already there, and especially to one that knows that Jesus comes for those in need. Our text continues, Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, you see, Jesus went to him again. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking to you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. You see what Jesus does. Like a shepherd in search of a lost sheep, he goes in search of the man to bring him into the fold. He was never really excommunicated. And as for the man, his I don't know grows into he is a prophet, which turns into he is a man of God, and I am his disciple, and Lord, I believe. What a difference a day makes when Jesus steps in. But not for the Pharisees. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do not, who do see, may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Cheryl Jennings' behavior upon regaining his sight was described as being not as that of a sighted man and not as that of a blind man, but rather like one who was mentally blind, able to see but not decipher what it was he's seeing. This kind of describes the sight of the Pharisees perfectly. While the man that was born blind was Jesus healed, the Pharisees are like men medically healed. They can see, but they can't decipher anything that they see. And this is what Jesus is saying to them when he says, if you were blind, you would not have sin, but now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Greater blindness exists in the Pharisees than in the man that Christ healed. There are all kinds of he stories of healing in the Bible. Sometimes people come to Jesus, sometimes Jesus goes to them. In our text this morning, Jesus went to the blind man and sought him out. The man made no move on his own to obtain healing. In the same way, like a good shepherd, Jesus still seeks us out. Yet we are not restricted to passive waiting. For as much as Jesus seeks us, so also does he invite us to come. Listen to these words of invitation, for they are for you. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. No one coming to me will ever be hungry again. Those believing in me will never thirst. And from the Gospel of Luke, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, writes Matthew. And from Revelation, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and they with me. Whatever is your situation, whether you have just enough strength to wait for Jesus or you are strong enough to seek and knock, rejoice in knowing that Jesus is there. He's waiting for those who come to the, him and he is seeking those who don't have the strength and his healing goes deeper than we ever knew it needed to go. When Jesus heals, we are fully healed. Amen.
All that we have is a gift from God. In faith and gratitude, we return now a portion of what we have so abundantly received as grateful heirs of the promises of God. The ushers will bring forth. Gracious God, we dedicate to you not only these gifts, but also ourselves in deep gratitude for blessing us that we may be a blessing to others. Accept what we bring for your own good purposes. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is inspired from our text from this morning, Amazing Grace, hymn number 649. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, springing up like living water, fill your hearts and flow through your life as you go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
IU, Lynn.